Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. You're uh, very welcome to this event, which is uh, co-organised by the Institute and the Irish Member Committee of the uh, World Energy uh, Council. And for those who don't know the WEC, the World Energy Council, it's uh, the principal impartial networks of energy leaders and practitioners working on stable, environmental sensitive uh, energy systems and has been in existence since 1923. It's uh, UN accredited and has uh, more than 3,000 members in uh, 90 uh, countries. And I should say on behalf of WEC Ireland that we're very grateful for the support uh, of Airgrid and uh, ESP. Uh, this talk today is very timely about hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen has been much in the news recently. Uh, the level of discourse has increased. Those of you following the G20 in Japan will have uh, noticed uh, an IEA report on that. Hydrogen is a, a vector of energy, uh, a feedstock. It's useful for uh, re renewable energy in terms of power to gas and in storage. And it's resurging again recently, I think, because uh, fuel cell technology has uh, come down in price, as well as renewable electricity, and many countries are becoming engaged with it. Um, and to explore uh, the hydrogen economy, we have two excellent speakers here. Uh, first of all, we have uh, Dr. Angela Wilkinson. You're very welcome to the Institute, Angela. Angela is the Senior Director on uh, Business and Insights at the World Energy Council. Uh, we have uh, Alexander Florenstein from Hydrogen Europe, which is the leading trade association representing the entire uh, value chain in hydrogen. And you're very welcome to the Institute, too. Um, each of the speakers will speak for about 20 minutes, um, and the uh, sessions uh, will be recorded. Uh, and afterwards, there's a chance for you to ask some questions. That will be, of course, under the Chatham House rules, so that the first part of the session is on the record, the latter part is off, which means that you can use the material, but you may not identify this house or either of the speakers. If you're minded to tweet, uh, please use the hash at IIEA and uh, put your uh, mobile phones to uh, silent. And so with all of that, um, I guess Angela will ask you, is hydrogen hope or hype? Let me, let me, thank you very much. May I? Thank you. Hello everybody. Thank you very much for a very warm welcome. I'm very pleased to be back in Ireland. I married a man from Tipperary nearly 30 years ago. I consider this to be a home from home. What I'm going to do, we, 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 we want to be complementary as well as we, we don't mind disagreeing with each other, but what we're really here to do is to try and help introduce the situation around hydrogen. This is the first time I understand it's being presented in the Irish context. So I'm going to talk very much about the bigger global picture and, and then we're going to talk about the more European specifics. So that would be one way of thinking about our different talks. So I'm going to present one study that we've recently completed around the hydrogen economy. But let me, let me just first start, if I don't give you the advert, I will be, uh, when I go home, I will get um, told off. But you've already done an excellent job of talking about, you know, 1923, who the World Energy Council is. We're all vectors, all sectors. We reach the parts of the energy system that other actors can't reach. We're OECD and non-OECD. And we are a technology neutral, technology agnostic, act but not passive around global energy transition and the success of energy transition at national and regional level. What I'm going to talk about is one of our recent studies, but what we actually produce for our members is what we call a practical transition toolkit, which has five different sets of tools in it that can be used by companies, countries, cities and communities to actually make sense of where are they in energy transition, where do they want to get to and how are they going to achieve it. And for us, energy transition is not just about decarbonisation, it's also about taking care of energy security as well as the sustainability, as well as the affordability and the equity issues involved. And I'll touch a little bit upon um, our an innovation insights brief that we're just finishing on hydrogen. We've also just completed work on existing infrastructure where we're looking at stranded assets, decommissioning and repurposing, which touches on the hydrogen theme as well. And we also have a paper coming out on storage soon, which also touches on the hydrogen um, connector, as I might call it. And I'll touch upon some of these other tools. 
Recently, the IEA published a report on hydrogen in the, advance, uh, in the run up to the G20. The World Energy Council went out first earlier this year with our own um, insights brief, innovation insights brief on hydrogen. And the story, of course, is for those of us who are old enough to remember. Um, you know, in the 1970s, we were getting a little bit excited about hydrogen in the context of all the energy oil price shocks at the time. We were getting excited about the possibilities of coal produced hydrogen. These days, that's known as grey hydrogen, right? It used to be called brown. It's now called grey. And we were, getting, we were thinking about all those, fuel, those, all those long queues at the petrol station who would have access to transportation fuels. That was the 1970s back context. Now we get very excited about hydrogen, not because of what happened in the past, but because of what we think is going to happen in the future. And all the new energy visions that are coming about, which are increasingly not about grey hydrogen, but about multiple shades of blue and green hydrogen. So well, hopefully by the end of today, if nothing else, you'll walk out of this talk knowing your, your grey from your blue and your green hydrogen, if you don't know that already. And some of the things that are driving that discussion are the excitement about the falling costs of renewables, which makes it much cheaper to produce hydrogen, um, and particularly green hydrogen. So if you're using renewables to produce hydrogen, it's called green hydrogen. If you're using gas and CCS to produce hydrogen, it's called blue hydrogen, right? Um, we're looking at other developments around storage game changers. We're looking at other developments about how um, national governments are doing things called sector coupling. And they're looking particularly about how do they manage deep decarbonisation by not just focusing on energy, but also on the connections between energy and transport, energy and buildings, energy and industry. And we're also looking at the new geopolitics, which is shaping the energy plays around the world, which are not just about oil and gas anymore, but increasingly about information, uh, technology and data, and the resources that are required for the renewables revolution and the battery revolution, not just the clean energy revolution. So we've published this new brief, Why Hydrogen? Because hydrogen energy transition increasingly or has always required a mix of electrons and hydrogen. And the World Energy Council is always very interested in the dichotomy that seems to be presented in many of the debates between those who are in the electrification part of the transition dialogue and those who are in the molecular part or liquids part and the little common ground that there can be between them. So energy transition requires a mix of electrons and molecules. We can't electrify everything. There are some things that still require um, molecules. Hydrogen can reach the hard-to-abate sectors um, that electrification can't currently. There are new opportunities for trade in clean energy that are coming about in the world, and it costs 10 times as much to transport an electron as it does to transport a molecule. So somewhere we need liquids in the system. And um, high renewable penetration increasingly requires new types of storage, not just daily, not just hourly, but increasingly on demand and from many different places. So hydrogen matters in all of these senses. There are many shades of green and blue production pathways. Just to try and introduce some of them, I talked about grey hydrogen. It's intensive in terms of carbon dioxide. It's low cost, but it has very low social acceptability in many parts of the world. Blue hydrogen has lower, produces less CO2. It is more expensive because of the cost of electrolyzers or the cost of carbon capture and storage. And its social acceptance is better than grey. And then green hydrogen, which is about using renewables or zero, net zero emissions um, carbon in terms of carbon, it's more expensive, but its social acceptance is high. And what we see is even when, excited, when hydrogen producers get very excited about blue hydrogen, some of the adjacent sectors like aviation don't want to use it because they think that there will be some form of lack of social acceptability of blue rather than green. What's new in the hydrogen business globally when we take a look? So we've interviewed, we interviewed use, uh, people who are actually bringing forward the new hydrogen economy, the people who are investing in it, who are actually piloting it, who are actually producing hydrogen and the different value chains in different parts of the world. What we have found is that there are now over 50 countries with mandates, policies and goals on um, hydrogen. Those include um, um, China, the Middle East, in the Middle East, Japan, Australia, as well as, of course, in Ireland itself. Um, the falling costs of renewables, 
zero marginal costs, the falling costs of electrolyzers, we expect those to come down very quickly, and the falling costs of carbon capture and storage are all contributing to the hydrogen um, business case. Fuel cell costs are also, have also dropped in terms of um, compared with battery electric vehicles or other types of, of um, energy applications. So we have fuel cell costs and an expectation by many that we will see uh, cost parity between fuel cells and um, battery electric vehicles in the mid-2020s. That's just around the corner. And we also have found the biggest change that we have detected internationally is the amount of talk there is about China as somebody who's going to be a market shaper in this area and the amount of investment that is going on in China in terms of their hydrogen development commitments. That's not to underscore, not to, not to um, detract from the increasing partnership between places like Japan and the Middle East who are also pushing a very big hydrogen investment and business development case. It's a flexible fuel. This is what makes it attractive. It gets used in many, for many different um, things, so it gets used in power generation, gets used in mobility, gets used in industry, gets used for heat, and it gets used for storage. In the economics of it, the biggest pulls are around mobility at the moment. They're expected to be followed by industrial energy use and power generation in terms of where there's scalable economics. But the future of hydrogen, whether it's blue, green, or even grey, is not a simple, simple trajectory of inevitable um, development. We have found that although the economics of hydrogen have changed dramatically in terms of production, the economics of transporting hydrogen from where it is produced to where it gets used also require a lot more cooperation if that's really going to be the game, the, if it's really going to significantly grow. And that depends on policy not just markets. And the biggest policy change is the policy around decarbonisation and whether it's maintained or not or whether we see fragmented policies and very little international cooperation. So we have four different futures for hydrogen. We have a world where we have coordinated international action on decarbonisation and we have favourable economics not just in terms of production but whole value ecosystem and then we can get to the hydrogen society. By contrast, we could see a future for hydrogen where we see fragmented energy policies, less co international cooperation around decarbonisation, and we see a lot of investment around hydrogen production costs, but very little value whole supply chain um, development. And in that case, we would be down in the bottom left-hand corner of niche to limited applications for hydrogen. So not a given future, but a very interesting future. And I think... For Ireland, you have a huge play around um, putting increasing amounts of variable renewables onto your grid. The hydrogen opportunities are, as far as we can see, many and different in Ireland. Even given the constraints around being a small island, um, uh, being an island energy community on the edge of, of the European uh, continent, we have um, the possibility for linking um, energy transition to industrial policy in Ireland. How will hydrogen play, not just as you think about decarbonisation, but also about new industrial development and what will happen in the future of the jobs and industry market around how can we manage a, an affordable, not just a faster and deeper decarbonisation and how hydrogen pathways contribute to social justice and affordability of clean energy transition, about an opportunity to use existing infrastructure if it's coming from gas and CCS or if it's coming just from electrolysis or if it's from um, the possibility to develop long range. You could think about yourself as the Atlantic wind frontier export market for the new hydrogen economy. Um, and many different opportunities depending, of course, on not just how we produce it, but also what value chain gets developed in Ireland, but also between Ireland and other countries in terms of import and export opportunities. So that's my total big picture look on hydrogen. It's got a very big, bright future. It's being invested in in many parts of the world. 
The biggest surprise has been China's move very quickly into this space and the amount of investment that's going into this space in the Middle East and Japanese partnerships. The Asia Pacific is moving much faster than Europe. Um, the US is not, not out of the picture, but the plays for hydrogen are very different in different parts of the world. And I shall leave it there. Well, thank you very much for that, uh, Angela. And uh, straight away, Alexandra, I invite you to give us the European perspective. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much for the Institute for organizing such a well-attended event. And thank you for all the participants to, to actually be here and uh, take their time to, to, to see where hydrogen is, uh, is going. My name is Alexander Frischtan. I'm from Hydrogen Europe, the leading association of the hydrogen uh, industry. When I say hydrogen, I only say uh, renewable hydrogen and uh, and low carbon hydrogen. So that's what we stand for. That's what we 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 represent. I wanted to get that out there from the from the very beginning. Um, is my presentation on? All right. Here we are. So I want to, to give an idea about the scale of the problem here, about why it's absolutely crucial that we need to act and why hydrogen is essential to, to reaching the, 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 the Paris Agreement goals. Here we have the amount of CO2 reductions uh, that, that needs to take place in order to stick to, to, the, to the two degree scenario. And already we're seeing that the two degree scenario is not enough. So we have a gap of more than 1,000 uh, metric tons of CO2 every year in Europe that cannot be met in the, in the reference technology scenario. And that part, that, that massive part, uh, uh, needs to be covered uh, partially or completely through the use of, of, of uh, low carbon and green, uh, and green hydrogen. Uh, that is what, what, what people say hard to abate sectors. That, that's what it means. It, it's a huge chunk of the need of, uh, to, to, to decarbonize, and these are the figures just for, uh, for Europe. So um, the way we see it, and you, you presented it very well, is of course the, the purpose is to enable as many renewables into, into the system to distribute that energy as an energy vector through hydrogen, to store it, to act as a buffer, to use it when, when we need it, and of course to then consume it where, uh, where, where it is needed in the transport sector, but we was, must not forget the heavy industry uh, sectors as well when it comes to uh, f as, a, as a feedstock or as a primary uh, energy, uh, energy source. Of course, uh, the challenge of, uh, of, of heating as well, uh, both in terms of commercial heating, uh, personal heating, and, uh, and, uh, and industrial heating is also an essential part of where hydrogen can be, can be used that way. The way we see hydrogen and the way everybody should see hydrogen is as part of a system. I think you made a very good point in saying that it's not the only technology that is going to be out there. It's going to function in a world where electricity is produced through renewables. It is then taken to consumers through the electricity grid. Uh, at the same time, excess electricity is, is, uh, is, is transported into, into hydrogen. It is then transported through a dedicated hydrogen grid to consumers of hydrogen, and there are many that, that need hydrogen at, at 100%. You may need to, to, to import it, or Ireland may want to export it as well, if it has the potential to do so. And it will, uh, for the foreseeable future, function alongside, alongside the natural gas infrastructure as well. So we must see it as a, as a part of a, a, an energy system, an integrated in energy system between production, transport, and consumption. Um, I'm not going to stay too much on the figures. It's just to say that there's a role for hydrogen in all the different areas that I mentioned earlier. Uh, transportation plays an important part, but the other sectors should not be forgotten as well because it, it meets certain uh, needs that cannot be met with, uh, with other energy vectors. Um, just to, to tell you about this report, you can look it up for yourself. This is what I wanted to present today, but I want, decided in the last minute to focus on more concrete things. Uh, so you'll be able to research this on our, uh, on our website if you, if you want to. It, it tries to quantify uh, the market for hydrogen in 2030 and 2050 to re in the different sectors to really understand where it's going in Europe. Uh, just the basic conclusions. 
we think it's going to go to 24% of total final uh, energy demand is going to be consumed as hydrogen. And uh, in terms of the economic importance of it, just in Europe, it's going to be quite massive, uh, a sector that is estimated around 820 billion uh, annual revenue and 5.4 million direct jobs, not counting the indirect jobs uh, created by the, um, by the subsequent uh, um, services. It has to be admitted and it has to be said from the very beginning that the different applications that, that hi of hydrogen will reach maturity at different times. Uh, you cannot con compare the, uh, the technology maturity of, uh, of, of the aviation and maritime to those of, uh, of, of passenger cars or the introduction of, um, of hydrogen into, uh, into steel production, for example, to some of the other applications. So this is something that we understand. This is something that we're also working with, with our members and with the uh, FCHAU. I will tell, say uh, something about that a little bit later. But to understand that it is a transition that is going on, it is expected, and certain application will reach maturity uh, later on in, in, in the following uh, decades. The political push in Europe for hydrogen is impressive. Uh, just last year, uh, the energy ministers of most EU countries signed the hydrogen declarations committing themselves to, to the sustainable development of, uh, of, of, uh, of hydrogen technology. Just a few days ago, the leaders in Brussels uh, could not agree on uh, EU leaders, but they could agree to mandate uh, the commission, the next commission, whoever uh, it will be as leader, to, uh, to undertake uh, concrete action to, to en enable sector coupling with the use of hydrogen. So the, com the next commission already has a mandate given by the European Council a few days ago to, to act and deploy efficient regulation, effective regulation uh, to support the hydrogen industry. So the political uh, specter, at least at European level, is, is, is definitely uh, present. Now, I decided last minute, also in consultation with the organizers, to focus about what's going on in practice and to show you that hydrogen is not something that we're looking for in the future or we're hoping it's going to happen uh, and, and crossing our fingers, but it's something being developed right now with concrete plans uh, on, on the ground. Uh, before I, I, I start, just wanted to, 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 to say that uh, we need hydrogen as an energy vector in order to reach uh, those sectors that cannot be uh, reached by, uh, by electricity. Um, it, they're complementary, they complement each other as technologies, but on the left you see a pipeline, and on the right you see cables uh, carrying exactly the same amount of, uh, of, of energy. This is just to say why it is unreasonable to think that everything can be electrified and, and hydrogen needs to exist, especially in a world with significantly much more renewable, uh, renewable energy. Um, so that is why Germany and the Netherlands have very concrete plans to develop a, uh, a, a uh, system of production and distribution through, uh, through, through dedicated pipelines. There's a lot, of, uh, a lot of things going on on this slide, so I will just explain. To the right is Hasunis, the uh, Dutch TSO's plan for the Netherlands that includes a backbone around the Netherlands with production capacities in, in, uh, in, in just north of, uh, of Rotterdam through wind, with production capacity um, um, in, in, in the north of the Netherlands uh, through both CCS, uh, as well as solar, as well as wind, uh, and for that to be stored in salt caverns there in the north of the Netherlands and transported all around the different industrial areas uh, of, uh, of the Netherlands. So this is extremely concrete with a clear timeline, uh, the different projects being, uh, being green lit, and one of the pipelines is it's a pipeline that exists now. It's a redundant pipeline. Uh, they will stop using a natural gas within that pipeline and simply convert it to a dedicated hydrogen pipeline. Uh, Germany has been producing uh, hydrogen through, uh, through, through, through electrolysis for, uh, for quite a number of years in, the, um, in, 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 in mines. Uh, they have been injecting it into, into the grid uh, for that long. Uh, now, uh, Get H2 wants to develop a hydrogen backbone going through uh, all the industrial clusters of Germany and, of course, connecting it 
to the uh, to the Dutch uh, to the Dutch pipeline. When it comes to the Irish case, obviously uh, we're talking about a high uh, target for renewable integration in your power sector. I think these are very conservative, but these are estimations and modeling of how much of the energy produced with variable renewable sources need to uh, be converted in hydrogen in order to stabilize uh, your, your, your grid. And as you can see from around 60 to 70% renewable integration, your, uh, your, the need for hydrogen production it increases uh, well quite, quite exponentially. Uh, and this is already an, uh, a conservative estimation. So that is already a need for, for Ireland. Uh, when it comes to storage, I understand that it's more difficult in Ireland due to the topography of, um, of, of, of the earth and, and the lack of salt caverns, uh, although storage will be, will be something that's, that's needed in a, source, in, a, in a form of the other. The Netherlands is clearly uh, ahead of, uh, of, of this. Um, and there are already existing uh, salt caverns that are being uh, converted to, to hold hydrogen. Uh, Nurion is involved in, 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 in that. So again, something that takes place today on the, on the ground. Um, when it comes to transport, when it comes to transport, uh, it is infinitely easier to deploy 100 uh, battery electric vehicles than to deploy 100 hydrogen vehicles to, due to the infrastructure that you need around it. When you're talking about scale, it becomes infinitely easier to deploy a, an entire fleet of hydrogen vehicles uh, as it is opposed to deploy an entire fleet of battery electric vehicles. This is again due to the, uh, to the uh, adjacent infrastructure that is needed, not just for refilling, but also in terms of the power, uh, power uh, need, the need for, to, to power all those vehicles. In terms of size, you can see it takes 15 times more space uh, to, to charge as many, um, as many hydrogen uh, vehicles. With, with only one uh, hydrogen refueling station. Um, in, uh, in France, Belgium, uh, in, in, in the Netherlands and in the UK, uh, the best business case now for transport in terms of passenger cars is the deployment of fleet. And if you are looking to deploy and, and start off a, uh, a, a micro uh, system in terms of uh, transport, I would look at, uh, at, at fleet first and captive fleets that can uh, uh, refuel at a, at a base. Taxis in, uh, in, in, in Paris, uh, London, and in, uh, well, in Brussels, they haven't arrived yet, but in, in Paris and in London, they're already present. They make the business case be commercially viable from the very beginning, both in terms of the refueling infrastructure, which is highly profitable, as well as uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the uh, taxi operator, which can function almost uh, full time without the need to, uh, to, 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 to recharge and lose precious, uh, precious time. So that is an experience in the passenger uh, car sector. When it comes to uh, buses, there are more than, uh, I don't remember the number, you have to add the total, <laughs> the total there, but uh, being, uh, being deployed in, uh, in, in Europe, mostly in, in, in Western Europe, unfortunately none in, uh, in Ireland at, at the moment, but these are, uh, these are buses whose prices have fallen from one million and a half euros, the high first hydrogen bus was a million and a half, to 375,000. This is the type of price reduction that, that you've mentioned, that the sector is, is, is experiencing and continues in, uh, to, to experience. So when it comes to what is different in, in hydrogen, that is the, the amazing cost reduction, not just in fuel cells, but along the entire supply chain. Um, also, why this focus on, on heavy duty? This is a comparison of the, of the weight uh, that is needed for battery electric vehicles on the right and the weight of the same system carrying the same amount of energy in, 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 in a fuel cell. This is why for buses and heavy duty transport, uh, this sector requires hydrogen, uh, hydrogen mobility. In practice, uh, 
there are uh, trucks being placed on the uh, on the market. Coleroy in uh, in in Belgium has already uh, ordered um, uh, trucks from VDL, uh, 44 ton trucks and 28 ton trucks to be to be deployed by the retailer in 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 Belgium. They have their already their infrastructure for refueling. They're just waiting for the the trucks. So it's not something in in, in the future. Uh, they're expecting to 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 arrive uh, later this uh, this year. In uh, in Switzerland, the uh, main retailers uh, in Switzerland also pushed by a quite a heavy taxation on fossil fuel transport. There, uh, have also committed to 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 to, to re uh, remodernize their 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 logistic fleet. To, to hydrogen and have ordered the 1,600 trucks from, from Hyundai. Uh, in the US, you all know uh, about, uh, about Nikola and, and their plans to, de to deploy hydrogen trucks. Uh, there's also to say more about all the different applications that already exist, and these are real uh, applications in terms of garbage trucks and other util utility vehicles. Um, when it comes to refineries, as you know, uh, the Renewable Energy Directive requires uh, that fuel suppliers uh, ensure 14% of their, their fuel uh, release for consumption is from renewable uh, sources. One of the ways to achieve that is to ensure that the hydrogen that they used in the refining process is of renewable origin. Well, there are already uh, projects in, 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 um, in, in, in Germany, Shell, uh, has uh, has developed an electrolysis uh, on its uh, on its refinery to to switch its uh, gray hydrogen to 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 renewable hydrogen. Um, I know this is less relevant for uh, for Ireland, but I want to talk about this case because when we do talk about hydrogen, we talk about decarbonizing all the different uh, sectors that are difficult to abate. Steel uh, uses coal, burns coal to reduce uh, oxygen in in the iron ore. Uh, and it could switch uh, easily to uh, renewable hydrogen, replacing coal uh, to do exactly the same job. Well, that's already being done in two places in Europe, one in Vestalpine, uh, at Vestalpine in Austria, and another one uh, in, in, uh, in Sweden. What do we do to support this from happen to, to make sure that this actually takes place and it takes place as quickly as, uh, as, as possible? Uh, well, obviously, we want to, 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 to enable this vision of a zero emission society. Uh, we have teamed up with more than 120 companies from the entire value chain, uh, with research organizations and with uh, national associations throughout, throughout Europe to create Hydrogen Europe. Um, we represent the entire sector. Uh, from, from the different parts and no single part of the value chain uh, dominates us. We welcome TSOs both from, from the gas sector and from the power sector that will more and more need to, to use hydrogen to, to balance their own uh, infrastructure. I won't stay too much on these slides, but I do want to say that together with the European Commission, Hydrogen Europe has partnered to create a public-private partnership. It's called the Fuel Cells and Hydrogen Joint Undertaking. Uh, it's a different uh, organization, but 50% is Hydrogen Europe and 50% is the European Commission. Uh, what the joint undertaking does as a public-private partnership and has been doing for the past 10 years uh, was make sure that this uh, energy revolution takes place in Europe as has funded the, the research needed and the demonstration projects needed to prove that the technology is, 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 is ready to, 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 to function on the market. The past 10 years, uh, more than 244 projects were, 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 were funded, uh, over one, almost a billion now of, uh, of, uh, of euros uh, have been, have been uh, provided to, 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 to research and demonstration projects and have allowed uh, the, the industry to, 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 to prove itself uh, as, as market, uh, as market uh, ready. That's everything I wanted to, to say about that. Thank you.